Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to welcome you to the NSHSS University panel. My name is Courtney Sample. I am the Associate Director of Events and Tours at NSHSS. And we have a great lineup for everybody tonight. Um, while we're waiting for everybody to come in, please use the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. I'm currently in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, where are all of you guys from, um, our panelists? If you guys want to just give a little shout out to your state or city. Hi there. I am from Laramie, Wyoming, so out west. Definitely a little chilly out this direction and excited to hear where everyone else is from. Hi, everybody. I'm John Crozy Durham. I'm based in New York and representing Monash University, which is in Melbourne, Australia. I'm Emily Gruby, and I am based in Durham, North Carolina at Duke University, but I uh, represent their joint venture in China, in Quinchan, China, Duke Quinchan University. Hi, everyone. My name is Eden, and I am here in California representing UC Berkeley from the Bay Area. Hi, everyone. My name is Kira Lawrence. I'm the Events and Tours Coordinator here at NSHSS, and I am in Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks, everybody. Just looking at the chat really quickly, we have someone from Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. Thanks for joining us tonight. Wyoming, Texas, Maryland, Florida. Orlando, California. So we kind of have everybody from coast to coast and <laughs> even some international. We are so excited that you guys are joining. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Just want to leave a couple more minutes for everybody to join us tonight. Um, just some housekeeping notes. If you have questions throughout the presentations, you can use the chat feature, which you're using now to tell us where you're from, or you can use the Q&A button. Um, and ask your question that way. We are going to ask that you hold your questions um, till the end. So each university is going to have 15 minutes to do a presentation about their university. And then we're gonna open up to a Q&A at the, at the very end of all of the presentations. But if you wanna submit questions, if they're not presenting, they'll be happy to get to um, anything that you have to ask during the program as well. So we just ask to use the chat or the Q&A feature. Um, and with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. I am going to share my screen to kick us off and then we'll get going. Once again, we're so happy to have everybody here. Welcome. And we're so excited to share this information from these great universities. So as you briefly saw, we do have these wonderful panelists. We have Taylor True, Eden Nasher, John Cro Excuse me, John. I know we went over this. Um, Quasar Durham. And I thank you. Um, and then we have Emily Gruby. Um, so to kick us off, we are gonna start with Taylor. And Taylor works in the College of Business at the University of Wyoming, where her role as the Associate Director of Student Success Center. Every day she gets to work on ways to make students have the most successful experience. From choosing to come to UW, to planning their academic journey, to finding their career path after graduation. She grew up in Denver, but came to UW for her undergraduate degree and has been here since. She also completed her MBA through the business school as well. So she can truly call herself a College of Business alumni. She is thrilled to be here and spend her days helping students realize their full potential. And she looks forward to meeting all of you guys in SHSS members. So Emily, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm so sorry, with Taylor, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Wonderful, thank you so much. Let me just get my screen shared here. Okay, is everyone able to see that all right? Wonderful. Um, well, like she said, I work in the Student Success Center in our College of Business, and at the University of Wyoming, we're pretty unique in that we are um, really the only four-year school in our state, and that's pretty unique across um, the United States. We are a small town in a rural place, but we have um, a lot of students who really love the small town feel, the community of it. 
Um, we also are known for being one of the best value colleges too in um, the country. So a really low resident and non-resident tuition. But because we're the only four-year university, we're also a little bit like the only child. So we get a lot of state funding and have a lot of resources for students. Um, we also are um, well known for our outdoor activities. So we have a lot of different hiking, biking, skiing. It does snow here. So I know some of you are coming from Texas and California. Whether snow is your favorite or not, that is certainly something that we have in abundance here. Um, we are also at 7,200 um, feet elevation. So we're the highest division one athletics uh, field um, and, and sports complexes in the country. So it's pretty interesting for that side of our college experience. And we have such a great value and so many scholarships that more than half of our students graduate completely debt free when they're done with the University of Wyoming. There are about 12,000 total students, but like I said, I represent the College of Business and we have about 1300 so at any given time we're 11 to 12% of our overall campus and our average class size is really low at 32 so our students get the opportunity to connect one on one with their faculty. We have a lot of research funding, so we pull some really great faculty from all over the country and they're here um, in our main business building available for students to um, work with them, connect with them on research and careers. It's really great opportunity for everyone. And we are an AACSB accredited business school, which is the um, Association for the Advancement of Collegiate Schools of Business. What that is is a quality assurance um, stamp really that shows your business education is just as good as many other business institutions in the country. We just charge you less for it. Your overall return on investment ends up um, pretty significantly different when you come here. Now, um, one thing that's really special about our College of Business is actually our Student Success Center. And that's where I get to spend my days. Um, we have a variety of different services that we work with um, all of our students on. And it starts from before you actually step on campus. So that's why we work with NSHSS. We are connecting with lots of other business organizations. And we really help students all the way from being in middle school, even in high school, deciding what you wanna do, who you wanna be, and then helping you with that transition to campus. And then all the way through to you becoming an alumni and the cycle continues. So we really have a long-term relationship we build with all of our students uh, who come to UW. One of the areas in our Student Success Center is this enrollment unit. So what we are helping do is help students explore their different degrees. So I'll walk through what different programs we have at um, UW. We also do all of our campus and virtual visit events. We are helping students with their applications, not only to the university, but also to scholarships. Um, we also have uh, transition assistance and transfer resources for students coming in with transfer credits. And I know many of you would be, um, as well as orientation and onboarding. So everything about helping you meet other students and um, create that family away from home while you're here. Once you are ready to choose the University of Wyoming, you start working with our academic um, advising office. So they are the folks who help you with picking your course schedules, um, really selecting which type of major you wanna go into, uh, adding different minors, helping you with long-term planning. So you can add internship credit, study abroad credit, all into your experience for your degree. And then they also are really a hub resource for you to the rest of campus. So anything you might need, they are that um, central point for you to get help and then they can connect you out to other resources. Um, at our university, we do have um, a mandatory advising process. So we have full-time staff that are completely dedicated to your academic journey. Um, in some places, faculty do academic advising but we really want our um, professors focused on the classroom side, connecting with you about your careers. 
versus picking your courses. So that's really the, the second phase of our Student Success Center. And then the third one is our career services. So um, in our College of Business, we really focus on career coaching. The main goal of everything we're doing is to get you out into the career you want to be in. Sometimes you know exactly what that is when you walk into the university and sometimes you don't. So we're here along the way to help you explore those options and sometimes just cross things off the list. We do that through helping you with your resume, with preparing for interviews, um, finding internships, right? We want you to go and explore the different career fields you're looking at and make sure that they are a good fit for you. Um, we also focus on networking opportunities. You know, um, like many universities, our alumni go out all over the country and all over the world. So we wanna connect you with those folks so that you, know, you have um, a, a lasting um, connection to the university and that you have some mentors out there who've been in the career field and can help guide you a little bit. We do also host business specific career fairs um, focused on our programs like human resource management, marketing, finance, um, and we do have an employer relations program too. So in career services, there's two functions. One of them is working one-on-one -on -one with you as one of our students to help you with your personal and professional development. Who are you? How do you talk about yourself? How do you find you know, the career that's the best fit? And the other side is going out and talking to employers and bringing them back to hire our students. Um, there's lots of different ways that employers can um, be recognized as one of our partners. Sometimes it is hiring students for those internships or for full-time jobs after graduation. And sometimes it's bringing in real world projects to the classroom so that you can practice consulting as a student. Many students ask the question of, how do I get experience to get the job I want when I need the job to get experience? So we practice that through experiential learning in the classroom. And I'll um, go through that a little bit more later. But um, with those partnerships, you get the opportunity to do um, company days, meet with these folks, and really get familiar with what uh, a day in the life of your future career might look like. So those three units make up our Student Success Center. And um, altogether, that really builds the other side of your experience. There's the academic side, the courses you're taking, and then there's everything else that helps build up your time as a college student here. Now, um, when you're coming in, we do have some of these admission requirements. We are an access-based university. So we certainly have students that come in with perfect GPAs, um, the absolute top ACT and SAT scores, but we also um, serve the function of making sure everyone can have access to higher education um, if they need. So we're very flexible on our GPA and test scores for incoming students. Now here in the College of Business, we do have some additional requirements. You do need to have at least um, a 2.5 GPA in all of your business courses to move forward and graduate. Um, but again, many of our students end up with a full 4.0 at the time they're done. So we just are um, very flexible with meeting students where they're at in their journey. And as I mentioned, uh, our non-resident costs in particular are among the lowest in the country. We work really hard to make sure that students have an affordable way to approach their education. And this does not include some of our scholarships. Um, certainly, I'll be providing these slides to the NSHSS folks as well, so you can review these later. And happy to answer any questions after, too. Now, on the academic side, these are our programs. We offer degrees in accounting, business economics, economics, entrepreneurship, finance, management of human resources, marketing, and then professional sales. Many of our students are not sure which of these programs they want when they walk in the door. So you can also come in Business Undeclared and we'll help you through that exploration. Additionally, many of our students will add minors and you can do that 
um, perfectly within a four-year degree program. You can actually double major and add minors with the way our curriculum works and still do that in the four-year time frame. But some of those minors are uh, banking and financial services. We also have a blockchain program, so they are focused on the cryptocurrency side of blockchain. We are the only program in the country that really teaches blockchain and cryptocurrency from a business perspective rather than coding. We also have a data analytics program, um, economics and entrepreneurship at the minor level too, a hospitality business management, leadership, sales, and real estate. So these can be really great ways to expand on what you're learning in your major. Um, and like I said, lots of experiential learning opportunities. So we bring in a lot of guest speakers. We have um, on campus an ethics initiative and have a state level code of ethics. So we think that's really important in business education. We also do sales competitions. We do consulting projects. Um, we have international internships, entrepreneurship competitions. And many of these, you know, fun, practical competitions also have cash prizes too. So for the entrepreneurship one in, um, in particular, we give out 50 to 70,000 a year for students to start their own businesses. And on the student involvement side, we have lots of different student organizations. So this is outside of the classroom space. Um, many of these student orgs are related to a major or a professional interest. So you get a little bit of professional experience there as well. And they're great ways to practice your leadership and communication skills, network, um, and get involved in some pretty fun activities too. And finally, um, education abroad is really big for us, especially um, you know, at our university as a whole, but also in the College of Business. We have students who travel to over 300 locations um, worldwide, and there's over 400 different programs, uh, mainly focused in about 80 countries. They're great for giving you an international perspective, and we care a lot about that in business, as business is so global, of course. And on our... Um, University's campus, we have the largest um, study abroad scholarship endowment for a land grant university in the country. So it makes it really affordable for students to take part in these, um, you know, abroad experiences. You can do a semester, you could do a month, um, a week, whatever timeline fits you best. Um, and we also have, again, those international internships. So if you are looking for some of that work experience abroad, it's certainly an option for you. And on um, the career side, you know, no matter which of those degrees you're looking at or um, you know, what you've chosen to pursue as your career, we do find that about six months after graduation, 88% of our graduates are either working in their field, um, continuing their education, or you know, still looking. We don't require all of our graduates to fill out um, our surveys, so not everyone answers us. What we found though is the folks who work with our career services are certainly coming in and you know having multiple opportunities when they graduate. There are some students who choose not to take us up on all of these opportunities, but the more you engage, whether you come to the University of Wyoming or any of the other schools you're here from, the more you engage with the, the services and the opportunities, the better you know, your future options will be. And finally, these are just some of the companies that we work with, some local, some regional, um, and some that are a little bit larger. But either way, they're all great opportunities for you to learn about different fields, different interests, um, and explore what your next steps might look like after your degree. And like I said, too, some of our students continue their education, so we do have a variety of graduate programs as well. Um, like I said, I did my MBA through our university and certainly some other interesting options for you if you're interested in continuing. And that's pretty close to time. I have um, our contact information here too, but I'll be in the chat as well. Thanks so much, Courtney. Thanks, Taylor. And feel free to drop your um, email and that information in the chat so everybody can snag that. That was great. Really appreciate your time. Um,
let's go ahead and keep the ball rolling. So that was Taylor True. Thank you. Next up, we have Eden Nasher. Um, and Eden serves as the program coordinator for all the pre-college scholars programs that are offered through the Division of Summer Session Study Abroad and Lifelong Learning at UC Berkeley. So Eden manages the life cycle of each incoming student, starting with the admissions and recruitment all the way to the program completion. In addition to supporting students, Eden also works with parents, legal guardians, and high school or private counselors to help address any questions or concerns. Eden, thank you for being in, being here tonight, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Courtney. Hi again, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this time. And let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that I just want to say is what an honor to be part of this conversation and to be sitting on this panel with so many amazing institutions and so many amazing individuals. I am learning a lot from hearing from folks, and I hope all of you are learning um, at the same time. So, um, so many things are happening in the world right now. So before I jump into my presentation, I just wanna say happy new year for those folks who follow the Gregorian calendar. We celebrated um, 2022 last uh, month and happy new lunar year for folks who follow the lunar calendar. We are celebrating right now. And of course, happy Black History Month. Just wanted to acknowledge that. And um, what I'm gonna do for the next 15 minutes or so is a little bit different um, compared to what Taylor did there in that I am not gonna tell you so much about UC Berkeley. There's a lot that I can go over in relation to UC Berkeley. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about UC Berkeley, but I'm gonna focus my conversation in this um, portion of the presentation on a program called the Pre-College Scholars Program that I manage because it offers you a window into UC Berkeley. I'm gonna tell you more about what that means in just a second. So my name is Eden Nasher and my pronouns are he, him, his, and I serve as the program coordinator for the Pre-College Scholars Program here at UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley, for folks who may not necessarily be familiar with the institution, is located in Berkeley, California, in the Bay Area. As a program coordinator, I essentially manage the life cycle of each and every incoming student that begins with admissions and recruitment, so conversations um, like today, and all the way to your successful matriculation into the program in case you choose to take advantage of what we have uh, in store for you. So I thought it would be helpful for me to just walk you through a mini agenda here, just so that you know what to expect in my presentation. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about UC Berkeley. And from there, I'm gonna branch out into the actual program that I'm very excited to tell you about, our pre-college scholars program. I'll tell you more about the benefits, the different tracks that we offer, and then the dates and um, admissions. So pieces that fall under you know, the eligibility requirements and then how to stay in touch with me. If you'd like to ask us questions or um, connect in the future. So let's contextualize everything by talking first about UC Berkeley. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of UC Berkeley before. And so if you haven't, that's totally fine. This slide is for you. So UC Berkeley is an iconic research-oriented public, uh, very large university. We serve more than 40,000 students on a given semester. It is part of the UC system. And when we say UC, I'm referring to the University of California system, which is a world-class system. UC Berkeley, for those who may not necessarily know, is considered to be the flagship or like the mother of all the UCs. There is a total of about 10 other UCs, UCs like UCLA or UC San Diego, if you heard of those. And the reason why we are considered to be the flagship of the UC system is because we are the first in the system. So the institution was founded in 1868. So in 2018, we celebrated our 150th birthday. So we've been around for quite some time. Back at that point in time, in the 1800s, when our founders went forward with giving birth to this institution, they were envisioning basically a university or an intellectual hub that would advance generations to come. Little did they know that what they were about to give birth to was going to impact not only the local generations here within the context of California or even in the country, but it will 
take a life of its own as an institution and impact so many generations worldwide. So we take a lot of pride in the fact that we are considered to be one of the best universities in the world when looking at public university um, public universities ranking. So for example, US World News, Forbes would consider UC Berkeley to be the number one public institution, not only in the country, but the whole world. And then when it comes down to public and private, when it comes down to national and international, we're considered to be one in the top five, sometimes top 10, depending on what ranking you're looking at. But basically, we are an institution that is uh, known globally, and we are committed to making sure that if you are to join us, your experience is going to be one that is going to be reflective of uh, the status and the transformative work that we want to make sure that we are giving out to the universe. So when we look at our um, students in terms of what they do, not only are they drawn to UC Berkeley because of its, uh, its intellectual or academic status, but also because they want to give back to the communities they come from. So we are the number one producer of Peace Corps volunteers right now. So a lot of, a lot of um, students who come to UC Berkeley essentially take what they learn inside the classroom and basically put it back to the world um, and translate it in ways that could make an impact and tangible difference. And when looking at Nobel Prizes, we also take pride in the fact that we have a lot of Nobel Prizes. So a lot of our researchers and faculty and alums have been able to earn all sorts of um, Nobel Prizes in so many different fields. Um, and then our library system is the fourth largest library system in the nation with access, if you are to join the institution, uh, to more than 12 million book volumes. And of course, all sorts of databases and journals and video libraries and so on and so forth. And one of the things that I actually like to, to name when I talk about UC Berkeley is the fact that in 2020, we celebrated 150 years of women on campus. Um, many, many big institutions, institutions that have been around for quite some time did not actually welcome women uh, for quite some time as students. And um, we actually see that Berkeley, uh, shortly after it opened its doors, um, it integrated women as students on campus. And so for 150 years, we have had women as students, as faculty, as leaders shaping us collectively as a community and as an institution. So this was a little bit about UC Berkeley. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about why the pre-college scholars program might be a great way for you to start exploring UC Berkeley if you are interested in applying to Cal, as we say, in the future. So for summer 2022, the pre-college scholars program is welcoming high school students, very specifically rising juniors and rising seniors who will be 16 years of age by the start of the program. And there are so many different ways you can take advantage of the program. The vision or the premise of the program is for you to come and taste what it means, not only to study in a place like UC Berkeley, but to know what it means to be a college student while you are still in high school, so that you can make a determination as to where you wanna move forward once the right time comes to make a decision. We have different tracks. We have a commuter track, a virtual track, a residential track, and a non-credit track. And I'll tell you more about what those tracks mean in a little bit. And before I go to that piece, I think it's helpful to give you the big why. Why are we offering this program? And this boils down to the goals or basically the roadmap that we are hoping all of you who are interested in this program will be able to cultivate or harness by the time you're done with the program. The first piece is in relation to gaining a glimpse of what it means to study in a major university like so what happens in our program is you actually step into the classroom on campus, be it the physical campus or the virtual campus. So unlike other programs um, that uh, fall under the category of pre-college, we don't necessarily seasonally hire instructors who would be working with high school students who would be visiting us during the summer. No, what we do is we actually open the classroom on campus for you so that you are able to study alongside UC Berkeley students and be taught by UC Berkeley faculty. 
so that you're actually getting the real deal. You know what to expect and you have access to the same resources that everyone else around you on campus has access to. The other piece to keep in mind is if you're interested in our credit bearing tracks, and that's the commuter, virtual and residential, you will actually earn college credit while you're still in high school. And that would mean you'll be able to transfer that credit or units to your future undergraduate um, degree, be it at a place like UC Berkeley, for example, another UC, or any other country really in the world. And you will also be able to start the college exploration process, um, which would mean essentially understanding what does it mean to study in a place like UC Berkeley from the perspective of a freshman. So all the resources, all the services, all the spaces, physical and non-physical will be open and accessible to you. You can engage with your faculty, use them in the future as mentors, um, and even get letters of recommendations if you do so well in their um, classes. And this would basically be a good um, segue to the next point, which is learning from world-renowned instructors. Part of the reason UC Berkeley does so well um, globally and locally um, and has that kind of reputation is because our instructors are some of the best. They're pioneers in their fields. They are giving birth to um, new knowledge every day. And some of you are reading textbooks that have been written by them. So it would be so amazing for you to step into a classroom experience where you're actually taught by those very faculty um, and establish relationships with them on a personal level. Now, in addition to everything intellectual or academic that you're gonna be tapping into under this program, we're very intentional about making sure that you will be able to tap into everything beyond the academics. So going outside of the classroom, because we're very committed to having you engage in a transformative experience that's not only limited to academic growth. We want you to grow personally, interpersonally, emotionally, culturally, and in so many other ways. So we build a lot of programming to support that process. And we also know that you're in a place where you're trying to figure out how you wanna articulate yourself as you're thinking about the application process moving forward to all sorts of institutions. So part of the programming we do is to prepare you for the actual application process. And then finally, we tend to attract students from all over the world, not just a country. So you're gonna be able to develop uh, friendships and expand your cultural and social horizon. One of the common questions I get from folks um, who are interested in participating in this program is if they do well in the program, if they apply and they get admitted, are they going to be guaranteed an admissions offer to UC Berkeley? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. UC Berkeley is incredibly competitive. Um, as of last year, I think we were at 14% in terms of acceptance rate. And we, as a very selective institution, want to always be equity-minded and oriented. So by doing a program like this, this will give you a sense of what to know about UC Berkeley. You'll be able to articulate yourself better on the application when you apply to the UC system. And at the same time, you will be able to prove to the admissions committee that you will thrive in a place like UC Berkeley if you do well in the program. But that doesn't necessarily mean the admissions committee are gonna give you quote unquote extra brownie points because you were able to complete this program again. We want to be intentional about being consistent in terms of how we review applications because we're cognizant of the fact that everyone can take advantage of a program like this. Okay, let's talk about the different tracks that are available to you. So the residential track is for folks who want to get a fully immersive experience, not only to step into the classroom and study with UC Berkeley students, but to live on campus. So this is a great option for international students, students who are out of town, um, you know, be it you are in a different state or in Southern California. Um, and under this track, we'll provide you with room and board, meal plans. We'll have live-in residential staff, both professional staff and student staff. And we provide you with health insurance and introduction to the Bay Area. So we take you around the Bay Area to explore. Um, you can see here that this track starts under session C or D. That's probably not gonna mean much to you right now. So I'm gonna explain what those sessions mean in a little bit. There is a commuter track for folks who don't necessarily wanna live on campus but have family in the Bay Area, and they wanna stay with their family, just wanna come take their classes and go home, this is a great option because you will still have access to all the resources on campus. And by the time you're done with your classes, you're able to transition out of the campus and explore other adventures or pursue commitments that you may have. 
under this particular track, you have so many options in terms of sessions. And again, I'll explain those sessions in a little bit. And then we have a virtual track for folks who don't necessarily want to come in person. The vision behind this track is to really emulate what you would have experienced in person. So you can take your classes online in a way that makes sense to you if you have a busy schedule or you're in a completely different time zone. Um, and then we have a non-credit track. And the non-credit track is an intensive experience for two weeks where you are able to walk away with a good taste, a good glimpse of what it means to be a college student. But at the same time, you don't necessarily have to commit for several weeks because the residential virtual commuter tracks are going to require you to spend several weeks with us because you're taking UC Berkeley college level classes you're studying with the UC Berkeley students, you're walking away with transcripts and credits from UC Berkeley. The non-credit, on the other hand, is more flexible in that sense. And under this particular track, we have two options, the Berkeley Change Maker, um, and then the Berkeley Summer Computer Science Academy for folks who are interested in CS and coding. So I'm going to help you better understand what to expect under each track, and then we'll walk into the admissions process from there. So in terms of the residential experience, as noted, you will earn college credit with us. You will be treated like a UC Berkeley student. No one actually around you is gonna know that you are a high schooler unless you disclose that you are. Why do we go about it this way? To make sure that you're actually having a fully immersive, authentic experience of what it means to be a freshman on campus. In terms of resources, in addition to all the resources that you will get out of the program itself, you're actually gonna have access to all the resources that are available on campus. Uh, counseling services, the library, sports, health services, you name it, it will be there. And then in terms of campus community, in addition to the other high schoolers like yourself who are going to be taking advantage of this program, you are actually going to be able also to engage with the wider UC Berkeley community. So our matriculated students, our international students, our visiting scholars during the summer, and so many other populations. The commuter track provides you with a similar class experience in that you're gonna be able to walk away with credit from UC Berkeley and have access to the same resources, content and materials in the classroom. And in terms of resources, same thing applies. Anything that's available to our students on campus will be available to you. That would include sports and counseling and health services. And um, in terms of community, you will not only be able to connect with the larger community on campus, but you can also engage with the residential community uh, that are coming under the Pre-College Scholars Program. And we build a lot of programming so that all different student populations who are interested in the Pre-College Scholars Program are able to engage with each other. The virtual experience, pretty much straightforward um, in the sense that what we're trying to do here is give you a, a taste of what it means to be a student, but this is done virtually. So what we do is we reflect the in-person experience in terms of the classroom experience and then in terms of resources. So the classes can be completed synchronously or asynchronously, synchronously meaning in real time, just as you would if you are attending this conversation in real time on Zoom. And asynchronously is basically uh, an experience where you don't need to actually log in in real time. Um, everything is already set up for you and you can complete the course at a pace that makes sense for you. Resources, we replicate what we offer our students in person. One of the big resources is what we call our Cub Hub, which is going to allow you to tap into all sorts of physical spaces on campus, but in a virtual format. Of course, the library system is there for you and the college exploration programming that I referred to earlier. And then in terms of community, we understand that the virtual experience can be alienating in the sense that you may feel lonely or isolated, but we are actually pretty intentional because of that to um, ensure that you are able to engage with community around you, even though that might be in virtual um, world. And we do that by providing mentorship opportunities. I'm available virtually and um, accessible on a weekly basis so that you're able to engage with me and connect with me. Um, and then the non-credit is for students who are there to get a taste of what it means to be in a classroom on campus. Uh, but at the same time, you're not necessarily going to have to worry about grades or anything like that. You're gonna be still studying with inspiring faculty and staff. In terms of resources, you will have access to the same resources on campus within the two weeks you're spending with us. And your cohort is going to be high school students like yourself who are interested 
in that particular uh, specific area under the non-credit track. These are the dates in terms of when all of these options are available to you. As you can see, there are so many dates on the screen. I'm not gonna go through them, but this is just to say that I'm sure that you'll find something that will work for your schedule this upcoming summer, summer 2022. And um, similarly to Taylor, I'm gonna make sure to follow up with a PDF of all the slides so that you are able to review these dates. And of course, you can follow up with me, of course, if you have any questions about anything. So if this is all resonating and you're like, what's next? What do I do with this? Um, you can start looking up classes at UC Berkeley. Again, the premise of our program is for you to actually have an actual experience of what it means to be student on campus. So you can start looking up classes by going to our course catalog, which is classes.berkeley.edu. You can see this is a sample of a course. For example, if I am to go here and type in a, a keyword, this would populate what classes that fall under the keyword may look like. You can see also some information about the course itself, the title of the course, the course number, the number of units, and so on and so forth. So at this time, you can start having fun and explore. Um, and if you find anything that is resonating with you, I'll be happy to uh, help provide guidance around that. And then finally, in terms of sessions, this is something to keep in mind. UC Berkeley does not have one big semester. We have several sessions. Um, these sessions um, overlap with each other, but they have different dates at the same time. And it's up to you which session you wanna take advantage of. Um, it's helpful to note that you'll have hundreds of classes to choose from. And um, remember that these classes are UC Berkeley classes, which basically means they're going to be very challenging. So it's very important that you choose a course that would be suitable for you. And that's why we provide weekly advising to help you select a course that would make sense for you. Um, this is just um, our Cabo Hub, which is a space that brings students together to explore all sorts of opportunities to build community to find mentors throughout the summer experience and to be able to have access to all the different events that we make sure we report so that everything is accessible to folks. This is going to be applicable to all students, whether they're coming in person or if they're coming virtually. Um, so this is just something to keep in mind in relation to the program. Now I'm gonna tell you about uh, admissions very quickly here. Something to keep in mind is um, we would need you to be 16 years of age to be able to apply for this program, to have completed two years of high school and to have at least 3.0. You can see here that the classes that our students take and um, the fact that this program is designed for students to take classes that are called lower division, which basically freshman level. And again, I'm gonna be making sure to send these uh, slides your way. And this is just, in general, information about how to stay in touch. Sorry, Courtney, I took a minute there. Um, <laughs> no referring worries. back to you. Thank you so much, Eden. Um, appreciate all the knowledge. And if you want to drop your um, contact information in the chat for everybody to grab, that would be great. Um, and awesome. So we are just going to move right along. Um, next up, we have John Crozier. Durham, Durham, I'm 99% sure I got that correct. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so John serves as Monash University's International Engagement Manager for the North America market for Monash, Australia's largest university. Um, he has been in post for six years and working with a broad range of stakeholders, including alumni, industry, government, trust and foundations, and of course, student recruitment. John is passionate about giving students in North America the tools that they need to make the best possible decisions as they embark on their higher education journey. He has a rich practical experience in this area and we are so excited to have him here. Uh, John, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you, Courtney, um, for that warm introduction. I'll just do the usual awkward share screen moment um but it's an absolute pleasure to be here with these other fabulous uh panelists um and you know it's been really great over the last couple of years being in post here in new york um and building uh rich relationships with the nshss it really has been a fruitful partnership so i'm very pleased to um be here with all these fabulous nshss scholars um 
I, of course, represent Monash University, which is a little bit different to the uh, other colleges and universities that are presenting tonight because we are a little bit more far flung um, than uh, my colleagues on the panel. We are, of course, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so that is uh, a little, a little bit of a, a little bit of a difference. But you know, we're very proud through partnerships like with the NSHSS to start getting more students from the US on our campus. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take you through a little bit about uh, my hometown, Melbourne. And I'm also going to give you a brief overview of uh, Monash University uh, and the various courses and degrees that we offer. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to introduce you via a short video to a peer of yours um, through the NSHSS system, um, a student, Kate, um, who is currently studying uh, at Monash University because she's uh, probably the best equipped uh, to tell you what uh, life and studying at Monash is like. Um, so as you can see uh, from the slide, your Australian adventure starts with us here in Melbourne. Uh, a little bit about Melbourne, it's a very diverse city, uh, which is demonstrated through the broad array of events, sports, festivals and neighbourhoods, and of course, food that you can find um, in, in Melbourne. It's very much underpinned through its rich multicultural uh, history. Uh, and really there's something for everyone uh, in Melbourne, whether you like beach, whether you like hiking, whether you like sporting events. Uh, Melbourne recently hosted the um, Australian Open, the tennis, um, which had uh, a lot of pub publicity, but it's always a very successful event. Um, and there's just really a full calendar throughout the year, whether it's sports, whether it's culture, um, there's, there's something for everyone. There's live music on every night. There's shows, there's the International Melbourne Comedy Festival. Um, so it is really a rich, vibrant, cosmopolitan uh, experience living and studying in Melbourne. Um, and of course, people from Melbourne have come from a broad array of backgrounds. Uh, Melbourne is home to folks from approximately 200 different countries. Uh, it's a rather large city. It's the second largest city in Australia, has 5 million people. Um, and it, it really is multicultural in the sense that uh, nearly 40% of Melbourne residents uh, were born overseas. Uh, we have food um, from all around the world. If uh, you love your coffee, um, it would be remiss of me as a, as a Melbourneian not to say that... Uh, Australia probably has, uh, Melbourne probably has the best coffee uh, in, in the world. Um, so if you ever have the opportunity to try Melbourne coffee, you won't be disappointed. Uh, and of course, the infrastructure in Melbourne is world-class. It's very easy to get around um, through its uh, trains, trams uh, and buses. It's an incredibly safe city too. Um, so recently Melbourne was ranked in the top 10 safest cities in the world. Um, and that, of course, is based on personal safety, health safety, digital security, uh, and infrastructure. So that's a little bit uh, about Melbourne, the city. Uh, and of course, Monash plays a critical role um, in the vibrancy of Melbourne. Uh, it's a very global university um, and spans across uh, three uh, three continents. It's a very young university, but our outlook is progressive and optimistic. Um, and as I like to say, um, Monash University is elite, uh, but not elitist. Uh, it was established in 1958, um, and it's now Australia's largest university. A little bit about Monash. Uh, we've got four campuses in Melbourne, um, which will expand a little bit more on what those campuses are and look like uh, shortly. We have two international campuses in Asia, one in Malaysia, 
and one in Indone Indonesia. Um, and we have over 115 teaching partners in 30 countries. We are Australia's largest university. We have over 80,000 students. Um, we've got 50, 54,000 undergrads, around 23,000 graduate students and 5,000 um, researchers and PhD. We have an, a global alumni network with more than 350,000 alumni um, and around 17,000 uh, academic and professional staff uh, who are drawn from around the world. So as Australia's largest university, um, of course, we have uh, a broad array of faculties um, and course options. Uh, we have 10 faculties, which you can see here, uh, design and architecture, business, engineering, law, pharmacy, pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences, arts, education, information technology, um, which is more commonly referred to in North America as computer science, medicine, nursing and health sciences uh, and science. So in terms of what you might be interested in studying, um, we really do have a broad array of study options for you. The Monash difference. Uh, so we're a top 100 university across um, all, all the global rankings. We very much have an international uh, focus uh, and that's represented in, our, in the way our curriculum is developed and also, um, and, and also in the international opportunities that come, with, uh, that come with most of our study options. Uh, most of our study options at the undergraduate level are in fact three years. So that's a little bit different to the US system uh, where most undergraduate degrees, say for example, um, Bachelor of Arts would be over four years. You can complete those degrees in three years. Uh, another thing that, that is a little bit different um, about Monash University compared to our US counterparts uh, is we offer what's referred to as double degrees at the undergraduate level. So you might, you might want to study a Bachelor of Business, for example, um, along with a Bachelor of Arts, and you, complete, you can complete those degrees um, in, four, in four years. Um, another thing worth mentioning that's um, interesting and appealing to a lot of US students is that um, many of the degrees that you'd be familiar with at the graduate level, we actually offer those degrees at the undergraduate level. Um, for example, we have a Bachelor of Laws degree, which would normally um, be completed in the US as a JD. We also offer a Bachelor of Med Medicine, um, which again in the US would be offered at the graduate level. And you can also complete those degrees as uh, double degrees. So you might do a Bachelor of Arts along with a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Laws, um, and you could complete that degree in about five years. So um, if you're a student that has a very specific idea of, of what you want to do, um, you know, the, the double degree can be quite a compelling option because you can complete those degrees uh, more efficiently and cost effectively uh, in paying Australian dollars uh, by going down that route. Work integrated learning is also a core part of the Monash education. So uh, there are many industry-based learning options um, and many uh, practical learning options that are baked into our degrees. Um, and so that's a really critical part. If you're a hands-on person, if you want to see the practical aspects of what you're studying academically, um, then certainly Monash degrees broadly will offer some form of work integrated learning um, as, part of, as part of that option. Um, the other thing I'll mention too here in terms of the Monash difference um, is uh, what we refer to typically as the global immersion guarantee. What is the global immersion guarantee? So many of our degrees have what we refer to as the Global Immersion Guarantee, which is a guaranteed opportunity within that course to study internationally. 
Uh, it doesn't cost you any extra. It's baked into the tuition fees. Uh, and so that's a very compelling um, part of our education for many students who really want to get that international focus and lens. Uh, that's not with all our degrees, but there are an enormous number of study abroad options that um, are, are, part of, are part of nearly all our degrees. So if that's something that's of interest to you um, as you're going through your fit factors and what, what's going to work for you, I'd certainly take that into consideration. Um, a brief overview of just sort of this, the, some of the key facts and figures. So according to the QS World University rankings, um, we're, a number we're ranked number 58 in the world. We're ranked number 59 in the world for employability. Um, Melbourne is ranked number three best city in the world for students. Um, and we are, of course, our pharmacy faculty is ranked number two in the world, um, right, right there next to, to Harvard. Um, so as I said, we consider ourselves elite, not elitist, but um, it really is a world-class education at Monash. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for one second as I transfer over to the video. Um, but I hope you enjoyed getting an overview of uh, Monash University. I know it's a little bit different us coming from uh, us coming from Australia. Um, so So I'm just going to introduce you to one of your NSHSS peers, Kate, who is an American student currently studying at Monash, um, and she's going to give you a slice of life in terms of what living and studying in at Monash is all about. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm an American student from North Carolina studying at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And I wanted to show you guys what it looks like to study down under at Monash University. So come along, I'm gonna show you some Monash University stuff. I'm gonna show you some Melbourne stuff and I think it's gonna be fun. So let's get started. The very first thing I need to start my day, similar to everyone else, I know this is like an everyone thing, um, is coffee. And Melbourne is famous for its coffee. It has such a huge coffee culture that if you are a coffee snob, I promise you will thrive in Melbourne. So either I'll do that at home or I will go and out and purchase one of those. Little pro tip, if you guys like Americanos, they're not called Americanos, but they're actually called Long Blacks. If you like yourself an Americano, make sure you order a Long Black. Australia is obviously famous for its beaches, so it's something that you can't miss when you come to Monash University. Um, I like to start off the day with a bit of exercise if I'm feeling motivated. I'm not going to lie to you guys, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to run down to the beach and show you this beautiful area. Monash has several campuses throughout the city, so there's lots of different beaches you can have access to, but other exciting ones are Brighton with the bathing boxes in St. Kilda, which has penguins. Kid you not, penguins, just like wild in the city. Crazy, crazy. Actually summer down here, so um, we are not in uni at the moment. If this were normal uni times, I would then be going to campus and studying for a little bit. I like to, you know, study in the library or study at like, around one of our cafes there. Um, it's just a really nice atmosphere to get things done. Because our uni is fast approaching, so in three weeks we'll, we will be starting back in the classroom, I thought I could do some pre-work today. So I think for the next little bit, I'm gonna be sorting emails and doing pre-work, getting ready for class. Next, I'm going to meet a friend for lunch. Melbourne has a huge selection of food from all around the world, very multicultural. So whatever you want, they definitely have it. So another really exciting part about living in a big city is that there's so many 
opportunities to try new things. Something that I've really been loving trying recently is bouldering, um, which is like rock climbing, but without a harness. So you don't go as high. Super fun though. So I'm gonna go um, for a bit of bouldering with some friends. Then we're heading back home for dinner. Uh, Melbourne also has a lot of really fresh markets, which is so nice. Get really good produce. Um, and it also sort of gives it that like, you know, living in a city sort of feel. So it's really exciting. So this is just what we made. I realized I haven't even talked about what I'm actually studying at Monash. So I am in the nursing and health sciences faculty. I'm studying a dual degree in um, nursing and midwifery at Monash. I guess you could say it's like I'm majoring in both, but um, the way it's set up is a little bit different. So when you come over, Monash does a really good job of sort of integrating you and um, giving you tools to set you up to make sure that you know what's going on here, you know how to get around and get things and things like that. So um, really exciting. I know that it's a little bit scary. Um, you know, moving away from home is scary anyway, but um, I think the idea of moving sort of like to the opposite side of the world can be a little bit nerve wracking. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys that it's actually such a cool experience. You learn so much about yourself and about the world around you and how to thrive in another culture. Um, albeit it's pretty similar to the US, it's like don't, you know, it's not as foreign. It helps you get to know yourself in a way that not a lot of other opportunities do. And Monash is really here to sort of catch you when you come and um, help you sort of get on your feet from there. So I think in that respect, the transition to living here has been really easy. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It's been such a pleasure to show you guys a bit about what my life is like here at Monash University and um, what it has to offer you. And I would really encourage you guys to consider you know, studying overseas. Um, it's such a rewarding experience. And um, yeah, what a cool way to see the world. Good luck on your college decisions um, or uni decisions, as they would say in Australia and um, hopefully see some of you guys over here in Melbourne also. See ya. Yeah, so I think Kate did a really great job of uh, walking you through living and studying um, at Monash, Monash University as an American student. Um, you'll note there that Kate's doing a double degree, um, which, is, which is very common at Monash, um, but gives, gives her sort of the, the breadth to explore a couple of key different areas in, in, in medicine and really round out her education. Um, that way, I love the way she talked through the, the challenges of, of, of taking up study um, in, in another country like Australia, but then the, the rewards and the perspectives and, um, you know, the, the benefits that, that come with that. Um, the other thing I'll mention as I, as I close out is that we do have a very strong alumni network in the US that we've developed and engaged with over the last couple of years. So if you're really interested in adding Monash to um, you know, your, your, the universities, the colleges that you're considering. Um, I will leave my contact information with you in the chat like the other presenters, but I can also introduce you to a particular alum who studied what you're interested in studying or who is uh, in a career that, that might be of interest to you. We're very happy to, to make those introductions and make those connections with our, with our US uh, alumni base. Uh, and so my only other closing remark is to thank you um, for, for uh, listening to my presentation. And also, you know, if you're, if you're the type of student who's um, thinking laterally, perhaps thinking a little bit differently about what you might do beyond high school, uh, certainly, certainly Monash could be a good destination for you to land. If you have strong connections, strong interest in the Asia Pacific region, uh, you know, you couldn't ask for a better venue, I think, than, than Monash to really springboard uh, into, into that part of the world. Um, so, you know, following on from this presentation, I'm more than happy to engage with any of you who are, who are really interested to have further discussion. So thank, thank you, you very John. much. Thank you, Courtney.
Yeah, thanks so much. Make sure to drop your um, contact information in the chat and we will keep on moving here with our final presenter. So I hope you guys have a ton of questions um, that we'll be doing after Miss Emily Groovy uh, presents. So next up and finally, as I mentioned, we have Emily Groovy, who is a global recruiter, recruitment officer for undergraduate programs at Duke. Um, Duke Quinchon University with a focus on students and schools in the southeastern and northeastern United States, as well as the Caribbean. And prior to coming to DKU, Emily worked with international students and scholars coming to study in the US, as well as domestic students studying abroad. She earned her MS in higher education with a focus on international education from the University of Kentucky and a BA in history from Clemson University. She enjoys traveling and attempting art projects and reading. Emily studied abroad herself in both Italy and Chile. So she's excited to introduce students to a truly global education at DKU. Emily, please take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me quickly share my screen. I always say quickly, but you know, it takes usually takes longer than than it should. Um, yeah, so my name is Emily Groovy, um, and like she mentioned, I am a global recruitment officer with Duke Quinchon University, which is a joint venture institution that Duke opened up in China. So I'm actually based in Durham, North Carolina at Duke's campus, um, but students who study at DKU spend the majority of their time in China, um, but they do have the opportunity to spend a semester at Duke as well. So DKU is a truly international institution. Um, it is, as I mentioned, developed by Duke University. So it does have a lot of this um, similarities being that it is a research oriented liberal arts and sciences institution, but we've really tried to make it um, or take a more innovative um, and practical approach to creating this global institution. If you've attended some other info sessions um, with liberal arts institutions, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the word interdisciplinary thrown around a bit, um, but I do think that we kind of take that to um, a different level with some blended disciplines. Um, but we also have a very big focus on experiential learning um, and experiential curricular design. So I already mentioned this, we are a partnership with Duke University and I don't tend to have to um, explain Duke too much to students in the US. Um, you guys probably know we are one of the top uh, institutions in the world, top 10 US colleges. Um, and you do have that opportunity during your junior year to spend a semester at Duke in Durham as well. Um, we also have a lot of other global options too. So um, you have a lot of choices when it comes to where you wanna study abroad. But no matter where you spend that semester during your junior year, you'll earn degrees from both Duke Quinchon University, which is accredited in China, and Duke University accredited here in the US. Um, and like some of the other presenters mentioned, you're also um, joining the alumni networks of both of these institutions, which is a huge benefit. Um, and and you know, ha these have a global reach all over the world. So uh, you may not have heard of Quinchan before tonight, um, but it is considered uh, to be a small city by Chinese standards, but I use air quotes because it's still about 2 million people. So um, for the towns that I'm used to, at least, it's, it's a pretty big area. And um, the public transportation is phenomenal in China. You can get to both Shanghai or Suzhou in about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes um, via high-speed rail. So it's just really easy to get around, really well connected. Um, Suzhou is about the population of New York City and then Shanghai is one of the biggest cities in the world. So our students definitely take advantage of that location to um, really explore the area, um, go into Shanghai for you know, nightlife, um, for internship opportunities, for research, all sorts of cool ways um, to, to take advantage of that area. Um, additionally, we're surrounded by some very like picturesque forests and historic water towns. So it's just a really unique juxtaposition between the more modern and international China and what we think of as more traditional and historic China as well. 
So here are the, some of those uh, buzzwords that I mentioned earlier too. And I think that they really sum up our curriculum really well. So innovative, interdisciplinary and integrated. We've really tried to, again, reinvent the traditional notion of what it means to be a liberal arts and sciences institution. Um, one of the ways we've done that is by blending our disciplines. So all of our majors are essentially kind of functioning like double majors. You choose both a major and a disciplinary track. Um, our academic rigor is pretty strong. I mean, it is a Duke education in China, so there it is a challenging academic area, but it's very rewarding. Um, the majority of our courses are discussion-based, which is um, not a typical uh, educational style in China. So this is kind of where that U.S. influence comes in a little bit more, um, but it's also very experiential, and I'll go into, um, you know, what that means in just a little bit. Okay, so our professors are truly exceptional. They come from all over the world. About a third of our faculty are actually on rotation from Duke. So that's actually how you're able to earn those two degrees. Um, you take so many classes taught by Duke faculty, but the other two thirds of our faculty members are coming from the US, from China and from all over the world. We have a big focus on mentorship. So you'll definitely see your professors um, more than just in the classroom. Many of them do research with undergraduate students. Um, some serve as um, faculty advisors for student organizations. Um, and we have a seven to one student faculty ratio. So it really allows us to keep that focus on mentorship. Um, I do like to remind students that all classes are taught in English. Um, you don't have to know any Chinese prior to being admitted to DKU. Um, all international students are required to take Chinese once you enroll for at least two years. But again, you don't have to know any prior to coming. And the majority of our international students have never taken it before. So definitely don't let that um, uh, make you nervous or anything like that. And of course, all of our faculty speak English as well. So I mentioned um, the experiential components a few times throughout the presentation already. Um, and we've really built that in um, through our unique course schedule. So we have classes Monday through Thursday. Fridays are intentionally set aside for co-curricular education, like field trips, um, research. Uh, our career center brings students into Shanghai and Suzhou on Fridays for career treks. There's travel opportunities, volunteer opportunities, all sorts of cool ways to utilize those Fridays. Um, additionally, we also have a pretty innovative semester schedule. So we kind of follow the, um, the US or the Duke academic calendar, meaning that we have a fall semester from August to December, then a winter break, come back from January to May. Um, but each semester is split into two seven week sessions. So you're only taking like two to three classes at a time. Again, it's a little more intense because you're, you know, you're um, cramming a semester's worth of courses into seven weeks, but you're not balancing quite as many classes. Um, and our students definitely um, love to, particularly the longer breaks like Chinese New Year and um, Golden Week in the fall, they love to take advantage of um, that to, to travel around China, travel around Asia. It's very affordable to um, travel and because we're so close to Shanghai, it's a really great hub for traveling around Asia as well. So I've kind of mentioned this already, but we do have a very engaging academic environment. I mentioned those discussion-based courses that are kind of the core of our curriculum. Um, we have a very small student body. Uh, currently we have about 1300 students because we actually will have our first graduating class this year. So we're a very new institution um, and we're slowly increasing our class size each year. But we, um, even at full capacity, we're only gonna be about 2000 undergrads. So still gonna be a pretty small student body. We'd like to keep that um, student faculty ratio that I mentioned. Um, low moving forward. Um, we do have complete academic freedom. So if you're aware of um, censorship in China, particularly when it comes to education, you may think of things that, you know, you can't really talk about things in the classroom, can't do research on things like that. But actually as a joint venture institution, we're allowed to have, um, we're allowed to have discussions, ha you know, talk about what we want, teach what we want, research what we want um, without those, that types of censorship. And along with that, um, websites that are typically blocked in China, like Facebook and Google um, are accessible on our campus. Again, another privilege given to us by the Minis Ministry of Education in China at, um, for being a joint venture institution. Um, so you have access to, uh, you know, Facebook, Netflix, all those important things, but also all of Duke's digital library resources, which really makes it um, a cool collaborative environment. So these are the majors. I'm not going to spend too much time on this um, because we do have all this information online, but I wanted to quickly 
break down kind of what our blended disciplines look like. So the underlying terms here are the actual majors. The hollow bullet points underneath are the individual disciplinary tracks within those majors. You don't declare a major until the end of your sophomore year. So there's plenty of time to explore and really figure out what you want to study before you have to declare. Um, additionally, there's plenty of room in your schedule. About a third of your courses are electives. So there's you know room to explore, but there's also like, even if you already know what you want to do, um, there's a lot of opportunities to combine interests. So maybe you're interested in majoring in global health and biology, but you also have a passion for art history and want to take classes in that. There's a lot of um, support to be able to do that. Um, in addition to academics, we have um, some great student services and support services on campus, like these um, uh, departments listed here. So we are a residential campus. So we have kind of everything um, available within campus when it comes to um, advising for both career and your academics. Um, we do have athletics um, and a great fitness center on campus. We have a brand new sports center opening up soon. We have counseling and psychological services as well as um, other health services to just keep you, um, you know, healthy and safe on campus. It's a very inclusive environment as well. Um, and then we just have a lot of, a lot of, um, stuff going on. We have, you know, over 60 student clubs and organizations that will definitely keep you busy throughout the year um, and a lot of programming um, done by our student affairs department and residence life department as well. This is a brief glimpse into campus here. Um, like I mentioned, we are a new institution, so our campus was built within the last 10 years. This is an example of one of the dorms. Um, all international students will have a Chinese roommate their freshman year. Um, and then you'll share, um, depending on what kind of dorm you live in, you may share a suite style um, set up with um, someone from another country as well. We have dining halls, cafes on campus, including halal cafes. Um, we have student cooking facilities. We serve both Western and Asian style food. So it's, it's just very um, inclusive to uh, whatever your diet may be. And then when it comes to the academic facilities, we have very impressive facilities. We have a brand new innovation building that has state-of-the-art teaching, research, and artificial intelligence labs. Um, we have a lot of cool independent group study spaces, um, very unique classroom setups that um, are really customized to the individual course content. Um, and we are the only LEED certified campus in China. And that means that we've kind of taken extra steps to be um, to focus on sustainability and energy efficiency in building our campus. So we're very proud of, of that as well. Um, we are on the Common App. All students who apply are automatically considered for merit-based aid. If you wanna be considered for need-based aid, you just have to submit your CSS profile as well. Um, and we do award up to full tuition um, and the vast majority of our international students receive substantial aid. So don't let the Duke tuition um, scare you away because I, um, I honestly don't know anyone who pays full, full Duke tuition. So it's, it's very easy to be considered for scholarships and aid. Like I said, you're automatically um, considered for that, that merit-based portion. And as I mentioned already, we are on the Common App. It is a free application. Um, we also have an application um, through Duke's application as well. If you're already applying to Duke, you can just check a box to have your materials forwarded to us. Um, but do note that Duke does have an application fee. Um, we don't care at all how you apply. It's, um, it's, it's basically the same to us. Um, but obviously, if you're not interested in Duke, I, I wouldn't recommend um, spending the, the application fee. But we are currently um, test optional. Uh, I don't know what that, we haven't made a final decision for next year, so just be on the lookout for more information about that, but it's pretty standard as far as um, what is required on the Common App. We do have two application rounds, um, one early November, which is early decision, and then we have regular decision that's due in early January. Um, I definitely encourage you guys to um, check out our YouTube channel. You can see a lot of day in the life videos, um, as well as our other social media um, channels and just learn a lot more about DKU. And I'll drop my email in the um, chat as well, as, as well as a link to our virtual events. We have um, virtual campus tours as well as um, virtual info sessions that are kind of like this, but a little, little bit more in depth. Um, and we have a lot of other um, virtual programming offered um, throughout the year. So definitely check that out. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to learn a little bit more about DKU. Thanks so much, Emily. Great presentation. Um, and if I can ask all the panelists to come back on camera, we are gonna roll into Q&A. 
So for all of our attendees at this point in time, feel free to drop your questions using the Q&A button or you can drop them in the chat. Um, and, you know, I went ahead and had all of the panelists drop their uh, information in the chat as well. So you can snag that and reach out to them at a later time. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come on, and I will just kick us off with um, a question just about transition. You know, the National Society of High School Scholars, we get a lot of these students who, when they are leaving home, whether it's going international or a different state, that transition can be difficult. So working in that admissions, you know, area, any tips that you guys have for these students when they're getting ready to transition to kind of being on their own on campus? Um, Emily, let's start with you and then we can kind of go around. Sure. I think in the in the preparation, um, you know, before you um, even leave home, I think it's really important to connect with current students um, who have particularly in these universities um, like DKU and Monash, where you're going to a whole another country, um, it's great to connect with current students and, and you know, hear about their experiences. And um, sometimes it's more comfortable too, to ask students questions that you may not want to ask your um, admissions reps. So it's, you know, I, from what I've seen too, um, students love connecting with prospective um, students as well. So highly recommend that. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I definitely agree that like mentor mentality, finding somebody is great. Taylor, let's go to you if you don't mind shedding some insight. Sure, yeah. We always encourage students to set, um, you know, just some little milestones with their family and friends that they might feel they'll be missing. You know, set up some times where you can um, connect with them in whatever way makes the most sense for your, you, know, you and your relationship. But, you know, sometimes um, going far away and meeting other people is challenging. So do a Zoom dinner, you know, with your family or your friends that maybe are going to another institution um, or, you know, find a, a norm where you can share your different experiences um, on different college campuses. But talking about that ahead of time and, and setting some things up before you leave can be really helpful. Thanks, Taylor. Eden, what do you have for us? Totally. Um, I would second what Emily and Taylor said. Um, one thing I will add is for us, the premise of the program that we run is to help acquaint students with the campus and the university. Many, many, many universities run similar programs that will enable you to see for yourself what it means to be part of that campus. And I'll take it a step further and say, it's exciting to be in a new environment and connect with folks who come from different spaces and backgrounds and also serve um, walks of lives, but be intentional about finding your own tribe, be intentional about finding your own community that reflects who you are so that you are able to essentially carve a little bit of home on campus for yourself and obviously being intentional and able to connect with your community back home. And I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thanks, Eden. And John, you know, I think we just had a question come in the Q&A yes. specifically. People want to know about the double degree. How does that work at Monash? And then I think we can open that up at if any of the other institutions offer a double de degree program. Um, but John, if you want to take that. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. And thanks, Tabitha, for, for the insightful question. So, I mean, the 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 I guess the the short answer to it is it it depends it depends what you want to combine but I mean one of the central tenets of um, the Monash education and this has been true since the university established um, and alumni U.S. alumni say this to me on a regular basis is there's an enormous amount of flexibility in what you want to do so as I said a typical undergraduate degree is three years um, and what a lot of students are encouraged to do is combine two degrees from different faculties together so as I said a popular one which I, which I studied at Monash is a Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Arts um, and you can typically complete that degree in five years some people like to do a Bachelor of Commerce with a Bachelor, Bachelor of Arts um, and so you know in terms of how how it works um, if anyone's particularly interested I strongly encourage you to get in touch with me you've got my contact information because I can walk you through 
how it works based on specifically, you know, the, the specificities of what you what you want to do. So, you know, obviously there are certain requirements that you have to meet to be enrolled in in, in two faculties, but the, the underpinning message is that there is an enormous amount of flexibility. So we want to work with you to, to make it work. I hope that sort of answers the question. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, and does any other program offer a dual degree, Taylor, Eden, or Emily? Do you guys have any insight on that? Yeah, we do. We, um, you know, we have both the Duke degree and the Duke Quinchan degree. So essentially, you're um, you're only choosing the one major. Again, they're they're blended disciplines, so you choose both a major and a and a. Um, uh, disciplinary track as we call it so you'd get the uh, in, in China it's a, there's a few more options other than um, you know bachelor of science and bachelor of arts there's a, you know bachelor of law bachelor of engineering things like that you'd get that in China and then um, the Duke degree would be you know similar it, it'd basically be exactly what you'd get here which would be either bachelor of arts or bachelor of science um, if you guys are familiar with Duke there's multiple colleges underneath Duke as well Pratt School of Engineering and um, the Trinity College of Liberal liberal sciences, liberal arts and sciences. Um, and so it's similar to that DKU, um, the DKU degree is essentially like a college within Duke, but you still, because we are a separate institution, you still do get that separate degree as well from DKU. Hope that makes sense. So we do at Berkeley have a very similar setup to Emily and Duke, um, but the institutions are different. Um, so we do have a partnership with the University of Hong Kong. And the idea there is that you would study two years at um, the University of Hong Kong, so HKU, and then the last two years, you will actually return to UC Berkeley. And once you're done with your four years, you walk away with two degrees. So that would be um, one option. The other option is Sciences Po in France, uh, similar concept. So you would study the first two years in France and then come back to Berkeley and walk away with two different degrees. Um, so it's an exciting way to help folks go out into the world. So because of that, this whole operation falls under our study abroad office. Courtney, one thing I'll just add, just to sort of make clear and answer the question, with a double degree, you do walk away with two degrees. So you get a bachelor right. of business, bachelor of arts, it's considered two um, degrees. Thanks, John. Um, Taylor, did you have anything you wanted to add about the dual degree? Yeah, we certainly have students do that on our campus too. Um, and we do have one international partnership as well with Forsheim University in Germany, which is a dual marketing program from one from us and then one from Forsheim University as well. But then on our campus too, we have a lot of our students who do end up graduating with multiple programs. They can do um, two business programs together and have it still be the same amount of credits. Um, but if they do end up choosing a one business and one non-business degree, it ends up being 150 total hours. So it does add about a year of time. Thanks so much. And I think in the next topic, which is I think always really hot is scholarships or, you know, fee waivers or um, grants, you know, really what kind of opportunities do the programs offer for um, these young students to come um, and not pay as much? Uh, <laughs> Emily, let's start with you. Great. So um, right off the bat, I mentioned this in my presentation, but our students are automatically considered for merit-based aid. You do have to submit that CSS profile, which is similar to FAFSA, um, to be considered for need-based aid as well. Um, but one thing I like to point out, particularly when considering China, is just the cost of living, um, and especially for those of you coming from the U.S., um, it is significantly less expensive to, um, to go to China. So even though we do charge Duke tuition, um, the housing costs, meals, transportation once you're over there um, is just a lot cheaper. So the total cost of attendance, if you look um, side by side at Duke's cost versus uh, Duke Quinchan's, it's um, about seven to eight thousand dollars less per year. So it's, it's definitely something to consider in that regard. Um, and, and I tell students all the time, you know, when applying to universities, take the tuition with a grain of salt as far as what that is, because, um, you know, there all of us have different ways of funding. There's outside scholarships as well. Um, we, you know, like I mentioned, we have a lot of internal aid too. So just um, definitely don't write it off based on the sticker price because not many people pay the, the sticker price. 
Thanks, Emily. Um, Eden, let's go to you. Um, any scholarships or anything that you guys offer in the program? Yeah, so um, considering the fact that we are a public university, you know, part of the UC system, the whole idea behind a public university is to provide public access. So there are many, many, many scholarships that are offered. There are divisions and units that are set up with the intention of just making access um, universal. Uh, I'll have to say that because we are in California, um, a good number of these resources may be geared towards um, our Californian students. Having said that, there are many other opportunities for folks who are outside of state. And in general, um, we do offer a lot of merit-based scholarships for folks. So um, if you're interested in UC Berkeley, whether the pre-college scholars program or any other program, always ask for scholarships and financial aid before you move forward with the application process. Chances are you're gonna find something. That's great advice, Eden. Thanks so much. Taylor, um, do you guys have anything specific? Yeah, absolutely. And typically we use a series of just grids. So it's really easy for students to go across and see where their GPA and test scores end up landing them. So I'll just put that uh, link in the chat and anyone is welcome to um, see where they fall and let me know if you have questions. Thanks, Taylor. And John, what about you? Um, I know going to Australia can be kind of pricey with the flight, but what about <laughs> getting into the program and cost of living there? Yeah, absolutely. So I just dropped into the chat um, some info about our International Merit Scholarship, um, which is available to international students. So any, any students that are interested, I'd strongly encourage looking into that opportunity. We also offer a relocation grant um, as, part, uh, as part of our deal for international students, um, which I believe is around Australia, uh, 10,000 Australian dollars. Um, so that would cover cost of flights, relocation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that can be enormously beneficial, um, enormously beneficial to students. And yeah, similar to studying in China, um, it's not quite cost of living of China, but um, with the Australian, Australian dollar, um, the US dollar can go um, a lot further. So when you're looking at tuition fees and that type of thing, um, you can get a little bit more bang for buck, so to speak, um, compared to our, 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 our US counterparts. So strongly encourage students to, to look into all of that as part of their decision making. Thanks so much, John. That's great advice. Um, and I think we're coming up on time. So just as we close out, I'm gonna let each of you kind of go around and have um, you know, any final words that you wanna say about your organization, university, um, tips to the to the young students. Um, Emily, we'll start with you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, our application opens in August 1st uh, on the Common App. And like I mentioned, it is a free application. So there's not really any financial risk in, in applying. So I hope that you guys will um, take advantage of that and consider us. Um, and also check out that um, link that I posted earlier with our virtual events, because it's just a great way to learn more um, and have a little bit more in-depth of a presentation. Thanks, Emily. John, let's go to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks again, Courtney, for putting this together. It's been spectacular. Um, I, I would strongly encourage uh, students who are thinking about things perhaps a little bit differently to look at Australia as a, as a great destination for higher education. Um, if you if you want to zig when everyone else is zagging, um, then, you know, we've, we've, we've got a lot to offer. Um, and, you know, we're really proud of our relationship with the NSHSS and having our representative office in, in New York means we really do take US students seriously and want to steward them through the process. So strongly encourage uh, any students to get in touch with me to have a further conversation. Thanks so much, John. And Eden, let's go to you next. Totally. So the first thing that I will say, similarly to Emily, our application is open. So if you're interested in applying, you can absolutely do that. That's like my logical, practical side. Um, the maybe not very logical, practical side, my inner Californian just wants to say, it's an exciting period to be in, you know, when you're making a big call, um, a decision like this right now. So listen to your heart. Oftentimes than not, we look at our parents, we look at our peers, we try to follow what they're doing, we try to pursue what they're studying or what they have studied. 
this is an amazing opportunity for you to find your own inner authentic self and voice. And um, on that note, I just wish you the best in that journey. I love that, Eden. That's really great advice. Um, and Taylor, close us out. Oh, wow. Big, big pressure to end this. Um, I just think, you know, this panel is such a great example of all the resources you have um, out there for you at each of these institutions. And, you know, really, um, as much as we love the institutions we're representing, we're also here as a support to you. And we wouldn't do this role if we weren't, um, you know, interested in being um, that support resource for you. So please never hesitate to reach out to us. And um, there's lots of stuff to um, think about through all these decisions. And truly, we want you to be in the best place, the right fit for you. Thank you so much, Taylor. And thank you to all of you guys, Emily, Eden, John, and Taylor. We really appreciate you being here tonight and being a part of the partnership and relationship with NSHSS for our members to learn from you and um, hope to explore their undergraduate, graduate, or programs with you guys. Um, with that, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that you've um, at least taken some sort of advice or information um, away. Uh, with that, thank you guys all so much and have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye.